Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fashion Law Institute. We're here at Fordham Law School, and we have a terrific panel today. Uh, my name is Susan Scafidi. I'm a professor here at Fordham and founder and director of the Fashion Law Institute. Um, and last week on Halloween, we were listening to the Supreme Court oral arguments in the case that is attacking affirmative action. Uh, the defendants in that case are Harvard and the University of North Carolina. And as I said, it was Halloween, but this was definitely a trick and not a treat. Uh, as we have seen uh, earlier this year, the Supreme Court is not adverse to blowing up prior precedent, and they seem to be indicating that they may go in that direction with affirmative action, which is, of course, an enormously important tool in the civil rights lawyer's um, uh, toolbox. Uh, and so we looked at that and we thought, you know, let's not rock back on our heels and be shocked, as, as happened over the summer with many of us, when the Supreme Court uh, reversed a half century of, of uh, rights with regard to abortion um, or rep reproductive rights. Let's start thinking about the issue now. Let's call out to some of the smartest people we know, convene a panel, and not talk about whether affirmative action is effective or ineffective or constitutional or unconstitutional. That, of course, is in the hands of the court right now. But let's be prepared. Over the past two years in particular, the fashion industry has made a good deal of progress in becoming more diverse and in opening the doors to fashion a bit wider with terrific programs not only at colleges and universities, including design schools, the kinds of institutions that could be directly affected by a decision regarding affirmative action in college admissions, uh, but across the board with programs like incubators and uh, pledges to increase product mix and, and, and hiring and employment generally, all kinds of ways that fashion has been moving forward how can we keep reaching for greater and greater diversity in the fashion industry if we don't have affirmative action, if that is no longer available to us? And how can those of us who are attorneys find other strategies for being able to make diversity continue to happen and continue to improve and reach goals across the spectrum. Uh, to put that question more, a little bit more poetically, borrowing from our friends in the LGBTQ uh, plus community, how can we continue to reach for the rainbow when the Supreme Court's about to throw a thunderbolt? So we don't know what the Supreme Court will do, but it's up to us to be ready when it happens. Happily, this evening, I don't have to, or today, for those of you for whom it's not evening, I don't have to answer my own question. I can throw that to our moderator and panel. So let me introduce them, uh, because I know they will have some great answers to, uh, to, to that question and terrific strategies as we start this conversation, because this is really only a start. In alphabetical order, joining us this evening, we have Peter Arnold, who is executive director of the Fashion Scholarship Fund, and around this campus is known periodically as Professor Arnold. Um, so we're thrilled to have him back. Um, the, the, Peter has worked in the fashion industry in, in many capacities, including as a former executive director of the CFDA and, and uh, a, a C-level executive in a number of companies, uh, including Cynthia Rowley and John Varvatos and Kush at Ox, um, so has a lot of knowledge to bring, especially because in his current capacity, he's in touch with basically every design school in the country. Um, along with Peter, we have Ifeoma Ike, and Ife is, is, has the best title I have ever heard in any C-suite anywhere. She is the founder and chief equity weaver of Pink Cornrows, which is an, an equity uh, social policy and cultural strategy firm. Um, and she also, among other things, she works a great deal in the fashion space, including with the Custom Collaborative, uh, which is a terrific incubator. Um, so we're really thrilled to have Ify joining us today. Along with Peter and Ify, we have Colette Stanford joining us again. And welcome back, Colette. Um, 
who is currently Chief Legal Officer of the Spark Group. In your closets, the Spark Group means Aeropostale and Nautica and Lucky Brands. Um, and so uh, Colette is responsible for taking care, if from a legal perspective, of all of these brands um, had, and had previously also been a counsel and vice president at Tommy Hilfiger. Um, so a lot of fashion experience there as well, and we're thrilled to have her back. And we also have with us Kenya Wiley, um, who also is a, a member of our faculty. So we're all, always thrilled to have Kenya with us. Um, but at the moment, she is policy counsel, having spent lots of her career on Capitol Hill, uh, advising every, anything from the Senate's Homeland Security Committee uh, to uh, the Motion Picture Association um, on wonderful issues. And she is also a professor at Georgetown University. Um, so we're really, really happy to have Kenya with us. And moderating this illustrious group, we have Jeff Trexler, who is interim director of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund out there uh, doing terrific work in the free speech context and saving the world. Um, and most recently, uh, he won a case in Virginia that kept Maya Kobe's book, Gender Queer, from being declared obscene in, in a jurisdiction within Virginia. Um, but for us, he is our professor, professor of fashion ethics here at Fordham. And so with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to Jeff. Thanks. And again, thanks to our panelists and to everybody who is attending this session. Uh, it's a truly important topic, and we are incredibly fortunate to have this amazing uh, a set of panelists to advise us on what to do next. Because this really is, for the fashion community, a design problem. You know, we have one set of factors, one set of assumptions and goals that we've had for decades in fashion in terms of diversification, and we have made some progress in recent years. Um, and we've been doing this within a legal framework that I think many people find familiar. Uh, we'll be talking more about that legal framework for uh, the rest of the session. Uh, but what we're, what we're facing is the possibility that the Supreme Court is going to uh, take some of the legal tools that we're using uh, to fashion a, a more diverse and equitable uh, fashion industry away from us. Uh, and um, what to do next is not, as if you've listened to the oral argument, uh, isn't exactly intuitively obvious. I know that a number of the Supreme Court justices were struggling with this very question, as were the lawyers on both sides of the case. It gets, the, the, the interesting challenge that we face now in terms of design uh, is even greater in the legal profession. Uh, so, as some of you may know, there was a new addition in New York to our rules of professional conduct, and it was based on model rules from the ABA. It's being adopted around the country, uh, which say that lawyers uh, have an ethical responsibility not to engage in what's considered to be harassing behavior. And harassing behavior is defined as uh, including words, um, uh, speech that could be considered uh, derogatory or demeaning. Um, and it also goes on to say that lawyers, this, this, this provision uh, enable, does not get in the way of lawyers' uh, uh, responsibility or their goal to uh, promote diversity uh, for their, in, with their clients and in the legal profession and in society generally. But at the same time, the ethics policy says, the, the new ethics rule says that lawyers have a responsibility uh, not to um, engage in or encourage unlawful discrimination. And if the Supreme Court says that unlawful discrimination means taking race or color or any other of these uh, protected factors uh, into consideration at all, no carve out for affirmative action for private employers, no uh, plus factor to encourage diversity in the schools, uh, then it's an interesting dilemma. Do lawyers have a responsibility to tell their clients not to encourage diversity in these ways? Or more positively, how do they encourage uh, their clients to be more uh, diverse in a way that uh, courts would interpret as constitutionally valid and legally valid uh, by, because they provide legitimate, non-discriminate reasons uh, for doing so. So it's an incredibly challenging task that we face today. And to help us solve this problem and give us strategies, uh, let's turn first to Peter. You have been doing, you've done everything in the fashion industry. Um, and we're starting with you because th these are education cases and you are now working in education directly. And I'd, and I'd like to hear your thought as to the potential impact on, of these cases on diversity in, and diversification efforts 
in uh, fashion education generally, uh, and, and then possibly even go on to what you think the impact could be for, for fashion more broadly considered. Thanks, Jeff. Just to maybe give the audience a little context about my work and at the Fashion Scholarship Fund and what the Fashion Scholarship Fund is, we are, I would suggest, the foremost education and workforce preparedness nonprofit serving the fashion industry. And we work with a network of 70 schools. So the expected design schools like Parsons and FIT, but lots of other colleges and universities, public and private, including eight HBCUs, six HSIs, which are Hispanic serving institutions. So through that network um, over the years, we've been able on the ground with relationships with educators to really connect to what we represent to the industry each year is a cadre of talent that we've identified through a fairly rigorous um, case study competition that is uh, conducted on a merit basis and, and the results from which um, allow us every year to um, name a class of scholars. Uh, uh, this year it'll be 125 scholars. So um, it allows us at a time when, to Susan's point, um, we're hearing a lot of talk about how to diversify the fashion industry to early on in um, the, the pipeline timeline. Um, try to move forward uh, underrepresented talent and you know with a longer term aim we hope of changing um, the, the the composition of the fashion industry's workforce because we work not just with students who are pursuing design and product development course sources of study but um, business students Gabelli at Fordham is one of our partner schools um, supply chain, data analytics, really looking to marry a student who may or may not be creative, but who has an aim to or an interest in the fashion industry, but for whom that path is not as clear, and especially if they're not at a school that has a closer connection to the industry. So, you know, that's that's just to, to give you some some context. But I think, you know, I'm excited because we continue to do I think the hard work on the ground of finding the talent that the industry now is suggesting they're looking for, you know, um, I think we're certainly challenged by um, a lot of talk, but not yet seeing a lot of um, action in terms of um, placement in positions over time anyway, um, more senior positions, not just design and creative positions, but really um, business positions at, at at brands and companies. So lots of work to be done, but but we're really engaged in it. And so, you know, Ify, I'll, I'll say, is, is um, a close um, colleague of mine. She is our equity consultant. Um, we just yesterday had a, a meeting of, of our exec equity committee on which, as members, a lot of our alumni of color <clears throat> participate. And we asked them, you know, what would this mean to you? What does this decision mean to you? What would it have meant to you um, if you were back in school? And I think, you know, what was so striking to me and if he was, you know, the stories, the very personal stories of feeling post, you know, or as a product of affirmative action, that you were in an institution, but you were still one of a handful in your class. And uh, that handful got smaller as, as you got closer to graduation. And so, um, you know, really challenged by what this might mean in terms of, of, the, of the spots in schools that are perhaps, um, you know, more now occupied by students of color, but are not going to be if um, this case is adjudicated the way we imagine it will be. And the feeling of, you know, the profound feeling already of isolation that some of these students have um, and alienation and what that might mean in the future to them. So, you know, for us as an organization, it's trying to solve for uh, that future or against this issue and to see if there aren't other ways of identifying, nurturing, supporting talent, you know, to kind of work around the challenge of, of whether or not they might get, get to a four-year institution and really focusing now earlier in one's career at the community college level, at the high school level, to socialize what it might look like to work in the, in the industry, to connect with mentors from the industry that are relatable, um, that all of a sudden you can hear from and start to feel that, um, this isn't so aspirational, it might actually be accessible. And, and so just finally, what we are pleased with is that two years ago, Virgil Abloh, 
who was the creative director of, of We Told Men's and also the founder and CEO of Off-White, came to us very deliberately to establish his postmodern scholarship fund, which is focused on Black talent. So from our network of schools, really identifying Black talent. Students like Virgil once was at the University of Wisconsin, not FIT where he wanted to go, and but where his parents said, we don't see you going to FIT, you need to be a, a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer, like really helping maybe more meaningfully a student such as uh, Virgil was at, at University of Wisconsin. And so that work through the Postmodern Scholarship Fund is another aim to identify a specific targeted population of young talent, young creative talent. And Virgil was very much um, pleased that we have this network of 70 schools, but by no means satisfied and was really always challenging us to go back earlier, as I suggested, or go broader. Look look for a, a, a creative of color who may or may not be intending to go to college ever, but is super talented and is screen printing a t-shirt, you know, around the corner. So, you know, that's that's loosely our mission. And those are some of the, you know, actions we're taking to kind of solve for this problem. But it is a problem that isn't going away and hasn't and only has a very, very long term um, um, solution. That's very interesting. Um, I just want to ask you one quick question uh, before we move on to, to Colette. And that is, uh, you talked about th that you're having these discussions practically about how to deal with the Supreme Court's potential ruling. You know, I know that one possible ripple effect of this, I, I done a lot of work with nonprofit organizations and nonprofit organizations law. And uh, one of the principles in tax exemption is that the charity can't take actions that are against our, our against the law or against public policy that that, that, that could actually um, there, there are circumstances in which that could lead one to to uh, to lose their tax exemption, like in the Bob Jones case where Bob Jones University uh, banned interracial dating. And now the Supreme Court has flipped in an interesting way where they're saying you can't consider these racial consider. It's gone from stopping discrimination in a way to uh, against certain populations to we're just gonna wipe out the discussion of race altogether. We're gonna wipe out the discussion of color altogether. You had mentioned thinking about possible alternatives if the Supreme Court says you can't do that. And I'm wondering what, what kind of solutions you've come up with so far. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, I'm not so sure we've, we've taken the time to think through the consequences of decision that might mean that the actions that we're engaged in um, could somehow jeopardize our tax exemption. So, you know, I think we're nimble and innovative and creative, but I'm not sure we've really explored um, the consequences of decision that would mean that, in fact, our mission would be called into question if what we were engaged in in terms of um, our diversity work mm -hmm. uh, might might be in contravention of, of 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 the law. So I don't know. It's a it's a very provocative question that you pose. Uh, you know, I mean, I'd like to think we can continue to do our good work and be be shrewd about how it's done. But um, and I, I would you know I I won't say it won't happen, but I, I it would I'd be hard pressed to imagine that the work of nonprofits such as ours could um, fall in someone's scrutiny that might lead to. The loss of a of our our tax mm -hmm. exemption, mm -hmm. but um, it's a really interesting point and challenge. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very and I and I mentioned this and I want to be very very clear when I'm asking these questions that none of this reflects my personal point of view. I'm really uh, uh, we're, we're dealing with a, a situation where courts coming in and undoing decades of uh, of law and public policy that's been enshrined in in precedent. Uh, uh, over the years, and in, in a way, I'm, I'm uh, we're, what we're trying to do is look at some of the more difficult, potentially difficult consequences that could arise from it, and how we could strategize and design around them to come up with uh, solutions that preserve diversity while also uh, meeting the letter of the law uh, as as it's likely to be changed. Um, but and just underscore our commitment to diversity in the fashion industry. We have our first CLE word, which is rainbow. So for those of you who are attorneys, the first CLE word is rainbow. Um, and now I wanna to move to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Colette. And you're coming at this, we've talked from a charity and educational perspective, and you're coming at this from the standpoint of somebody who's been working it directly and is working right now in the business context. 
And I'm wondering how, what, what you and your team are talking about, uh, to how to respond, how to redesign uh, your diversification efforts to adapt to this potential new uh, uh, set of circumstances? Well, I kind of like Peter said, we're still in the, in, well, we're actually still in the, I would say, starting gate stages of our own diversity efforts. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's an important uh, value for us, particularly inclusivity, so much so that we actually added inclusivity to our core corporate values. Mm -hmm. So we take it very seriously, but at the same time, as many companies found themselves uh, in the spring of 2020, although we take it seriously, we were slow to start. So we have been, and I think this is, whenever I hear affirmative action, I think of intent and Peter said earlier, deliberate action. So what can we intentionally and deliberately do to create the diversity, to create the inclusivity that we want in our workplace? And the areas, well, first we had to look at well, what does our workplace look like? And so we did employee surveys. We also brought in a third-party consultant to really assess what is happening at our, at our brands. As Susan said earlier, we're actually now seven brands that organically were brought together, some from bankruptcy, some from mergers and acquisitions, but we're all together and all at different, different phases or stages rather of diversity inclusion efforts. So how do we how do we advance and recognize where the brands are at? So we had that study done. And for us it was focusing on three areas. It was recruitment and talent retention and promotion. So from a talent from a recruitment standpoint, we know uh, that it's illegal to make an employment decision based on um, based on race. So clearly we weren't going to be able to do that, but where were we recruiting, right? Um, because a lot of times, and I, as I was joking to Susan earlier, we stay busy here. And so when we have an opening, we need someone now. So what do, where do you go, right? You usually go to your network. But if your workforce is not so diverse, your network may not be diverse. So even though you may have intention to create diversity, what are you actually going to do about that? So one of the things that we've charged our hiring managers with is, yes, we know we needed a, a person, this position filled yesterday, but you're going to have to be intentional about opening up your um, your hiring pool. You have to open up your candidates. You have to look places that you would not normally look. I, I had an I, I had a position that was open for months. I was desperate, desperately needed someone in that position. And Friday nights, I was on LinkedIn, just going through. I'd gone through my network, and I'm just going through trying to make sure that um, we. I created diversity in my own department that I, that we're charging the other hiring managers to do. So that was really important. So I think from a recruitment standpoint, it's intentionally opening up that candidate pool. As Peter said, there if you don't open up the candidate pool, how does someone get a chance to get in the door? Now, getting in the door is great. What happens when you're there? And you have to look at what do your numbers look like? You may have your, I mean, I think as companies go, we were pleasantly surprised in a lot of instances that we were competitive in the sense of um, the diversity of our workforce. But when you look at retention, when you look at promotion, there was work to be done. So what we've done, we're focusing now on inclusivity. That's why inclusivity became a part of our core value. You have to make 
employees feel like they belong. So how do you do that? That means that when you're in a meeting and someone is trying to give an opinion, you actually listen to everybody. So it doesn't seem like the same person get to get to speak all the time. And it doesn't feel, and the person who may not be the most vocal gets a chance to speak. Um, so it's, in, it's intentional in terms of creating, we're constantly working to create inclusivity opportunities. Uh, early in, I would say, not early, probably in the fall of 2020, we created a diversity council, which is a cross-functional, cross-brand group of employees that we wanted to partner with on this journey. Not putting the work on them, because that's the other thing. They, everyone has a day job, but you don't want to leave your diversity decisions just up to your employees. So we do have a diversity director. We also have a manager of diversity. But we also thought it was very important to make sure that our employees were engaged in this process because you can design great programs, but if they're not responsive, what's, what's the point? Mm -hmm. So we, have a, we, we were intentional in forming this council and keeping it going. So every year we're coming up with topics that a new group can work on and help create more inclusivity opportunities um, in our workplace. The other thing, we, we have a newsletter that we're really proud of uh, because it featured, we were very deliberate in making sure that we featured diversity within our corporate offices as well as in our in our stores we have thousands of employees and it was their reaction of seeing one of their own from their brand from their store featured in a newsletter was awesome and it also helped us get to know each other more and we featured all types of stories mm -hmm. um, and that really that did a lot to create an inclusive space we also started uh, sponsoring forums. And some of these forums, uh, senior executives were not allowed to create the kind of safe space that if employees wanted to talk about maybe issues, you know, outside of needing to go to HR, but just kind of freely talk, they felt safe to do so. Uh, we, so we've sponsored several forums like that. We've also, we're on the brink of creating a mentoring program. Well, before I get to our mentoring program, we also uh, created um, employee resource groups that are open to all employees to join any resource, any employee resource group that they'd like. But from that, we're developing a mentor program. And in order to be part of the mentor program, you need to be a member of one of these employee resource groups. So when thinking about designing, I was thinking, well, if race can no longer be uh, a criteria at all, because it, it is slightly shocking that diversity as a virtue is being questioned in the business world, when we know from a fashion set perspective, how important diverse perspectives are how important it is to our customers, how important it is to our employees. So the fact that diversity itself as a virtue is on the table is shocking. But if it is, um, I was reading an inter interesting article that said that, you know, we're just going to have to be more deliberate and more intentional. So from a recruit recruiting standpoint, maybe I can't, we can't say directly that we're going to recruit to increase a specific population. But instead, we go to those populations. We don't have to say it to go into certain communities that we haven't always tapped into. Um, from a, a, a design or a collection standpoint, I know this was one of the questions that were, were posed, proposed we create design collections all the time. So as long as I think, as long as we're following a pattern of not creating a collection 
for a specific group, but a collection to celebrate the celebrate our customers, celebrate from various dis- uh, perspectives. I think we might be o- we we would be okay there, mm-hmm. but we would have to be very. We certainly, I, I I do worry about any programs that specifically call out a race. That that is very much um, up in the air. Yeah, it's and and I want to thank you for for all, all of all the insight you're giving into what you're doing because it's a very interesting time to be to be putting together these programs and rethinking them. And uh, first of all, I want to say, uh, by the way, we have a number of students uh, in uh, Fordham Law School, in fact, who are in this room where I am right now. Uh, and I, I hope you all heard uh, what Colette was saying about looking at LinkedIn. So I hope you are thinking about connecting with people on LinkedIn, including like Colette. <laughs> <laughs> Colette, sorry to, to inflict several dozen <laughs> LinkedIn requests on you tonight, but uh, I strongly encourage you to make these connections because it is something that that plays a significant role, and I think will continue to play an even actually play an even greater role going forward. Um, but I wanted to ask one question before uh, we get to Ify, and that is, um, you know, thinking about what Peter was talking about earlier and, and what you're talking about here. Uh, you know, there have been several, if you look in the, in the CLE materials that we circulated earlier today, uh, we included several lawsuits and, and also a, an action from a member of Congress challenging uh, a program. And, they, and, and they're literally from New York, New York to Washington on the other side of the country, uh, challenging things like internship programs and scholarship funds and um, and also diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And I'm wondering, specifically with refer- reference to the latter, if you've seen any impact on that already and how you might be responding to it. Oh, absolutely. Um, Florida last year uh, passed the Stop Woke mm-hmm. Act, which prohibited uh, basically any training that mentioned race or anything, basically anything that would make someone else feel bad. It's a a very interesting um, act to read because it certainly picks up on the the, uh, attack on critical race theory to the next extreme. So we can't say anything bad about anybody in Florida if you're training them. So I think it attacks unbiased training. Well, part of our diversity program is training to help people understand what these topics are, to help people, to help our employees understand, you know, what does un, what is uncon, what does unconscious bias look like in, in, in your everyday interactions? Well, in Florida, we can't do that. So we've had to design around that law for our for our training. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting and interesting to hear that in the, the work that you have to deal with, that you are you are already dealing with this on a daily basis. This isn't just something theoretical in the future based on what the Supreme Court might be saying, uh, but you know, we live in a, a federalist system where every state can enact its own laws. And uh, I, I, we're, I guess we're seeing this already. And no, that's a very interesting position to be in. Because if, you, if you're, if you know, I think what Peter said earlier um, about his, his, the scholarship fund, like diversity is the heart of the fund. Same, you know, with companies now, we've made diversity, equity, inclusion part of our mission no one wants to go backwards. Yeah. We all want to move forward. So when faced with the choice in Florida, do nothing or do something, we chose to do something. Yeah, which brings me, and that's an excellent, excellent uh, uh, segue to Ify, who is, you are a strategist. This is what you do. And you work with everything from you know mediation, advising companies and nonprofits and government. You, you, you do it all. And I would love to hear your thoughts on the current strategic challenges uh, that we're all facing and how we can design our way out of this rather difficult situation. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff. And it's always great to be in the same space with Peter. It's great to meet you, Colette and Kenya. Um, because I do think that um, strategy, oftentimes people look very quickly as to how to build, 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 but we don't necessarily look back as to like what we also need to unbuild and what it is that we need that we're actually, um, where's our actual starting point? Um, I say this to say that it is important for us to recognize that affirmative action in many ways was so problematic that we needed programs like quote unquote diversity, equity and inclusion because the law was not followed. And I want people to really understand what that means that we live in a society where there's hardly a consequence for being discriminatory towards especially black communities that have not only endured the history of slavery, but also by law were made less than a human being. So a lot of these actions and a lot of these laws are still an attempt to reverse Dred Scott. Mm -hmm. That is really important to highlight that in many ways, while I think it's great that we have the one person that gets into the position or the one individual of color that has the background that can make more decisions, these trickling effects are not actually going to do what in many ways affirmative action and the 30 plus years that it attempted to do um, will do. And this is not only affirmative action. I worked on the Hill on the Judiciary Committee when Shelby V. Holder occurred. Um, when you talk about the Voting Rights Act, which in many ways was revered um, in civil and human rights spaces. And now, um, you know, dear, a dear mentor leader like Honorable John Lewis died um, when that law was reversed, given the sacrifice that his body went through to ensure that that passed. That is, I think, from any strategist perspective, whether you're in business, whether you're in law, whether you're a student, we have to be honest about what the start of this is about to really then also investigate the blueprints that were attempted for then for us to think about how aggressive do we need to be and also recognize that the tool of law is not always the tool that's going to get us there. And that is a choice. Mm -hmm. That none of the progress that has been made in this country, especially for black lives, have relied on the law. They have relied on people in many ways, breaking the law for there to actually be movement into what we have. Sorry, students, don't know if that's what you expected to hear, but that is why, um, <laughs> that is I think why we're having this very real conversation that yeah. many of the people that we revere, the MLKs, the whomever, the Rosa Parks, the Claudette Clopins, they broke the law. And therefore, we are now in a position where we are celebrating several acts um, that were progressive. But I also want to highlight that um, part of the reason why in my space as an equity weaver, it's really important, and I loved what both Peter and Colette were struggling and grappling with, is that policy informs practices, right? So this is not just about the law, but this is about the practice within industries. And as of right now, Affirmative action has always been a shaky um, concept, even for black and brown people, if we want to be honest. No person walked around being very proud of the fact that affirmative action was there because there's this thing called cultural myths, i.e. biases, i.e. prejudices, that were already tied and woven into affirmative action. And so with the little bit of time that I have, I do want to highlight some of those myths um, so that we can actually get a sense of where we need to strategize from. And I want to start with um, first highlighting that we already have nine states, um, excuse me, eight states that have a flat out ban on affirmative action when it comes to education. I want to also highlight that the average age that we're talking about is 17 and 18. So we are talking about children and we don't often look at black and brown children as children. But we are talking about the ways we judge children as they are trying to pursue education and as they are coming through pipelines of educational spaces that they did not create. That is ultimately our starting point as to how we are trying to eradicate not just higher education inequity, but the inequities that happened before they got to higher education, right? When we don't see a critical mass 
um, which in many ways is a beautiful term that was a, a, from, from a long line of um, education equity cases. When we don't see a critical mass of individuals within an industry, what do we assume? We assume that people couldn't cut it. We assume that they weren't good enough. We assume that they did not test well enough. We assume that they did not stay because they did not have the rigor. We assume that they did not want to stay because the space wasn't a good fit for them instead of the other way around. And that is not different in the fashion industry. The fashion industry in many ways prides itself on exclusivity. That's why a lot of us enjoy being in this space. But there's also a very um, sad reality that the fashion industry is not cut out of a different cloth of America, right? That it is still connected to a selection that is based on cultural fit. So my biggest issue around this is twofold. A, what are the hacks, if any, that we can make and how early can we make those hacks in this pipeline as young children are preparing to get into the next phases of their life? which may mean that we are creating strategies that are outside of the higher education system. But also on the flip side, if we are invested in creating diverse industries, what ways can we work outside of established higher education and other types of pipelines to be bold to create that diversity? And Colette had mentioned how some of that is geographical Right there, I think there are also some other interventions as it relates to um, how we are supporting young people that have um, alternative um, directions and routes. Maybe they they did not go linearly into higher education. So, what type of um, work preparedness, career readiness in mass are we doing? And I want it to be clear that when we, I am not talking. Um, necessarily about, um, you know, VOTEC programs, which are still important, or technical and trade programs. I am talking about how we cultivate talent that is already brilliant, that already has a lot of the early makings of making it in certain fields and industries. And how do we ensure that they are moving through with the ability to try to practice and at times to fail and still have the tools to be able to learn a, learn a profession and still excel and succeed. That means that we have to reimagine education, but we also have to reimagine hiring and we have to reimagine risk. Because I actually, I do think that there are going to be some industries that are going to risk what needs to be risked regardless of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And I just want us to, to hold that um, recognition that we are not starting um, from a tabula rasa, we are not starting um, as if this is new, um, but we are also um, holding that the regression of this, which certain states like California, uh, Oklahoma, Michigan, have already been grappling by pouring in millions of dollars to try to rectify what laws have already done, which is already a window into what will happen with the Supreme Court. And they still have not been able to create the diverse dynamics that mm -hmm. they know is important to all students on the campus. So I think it's, I think we're going to have to be honest with ourselves about what are we going to do when the Supreme Court comes down with something that is a threat, not only to the viability of how we all learn, but as we are also seeing in California and Oklahoma, we are seeing a reduction across the board of Black, Hispanic, Latinx communities in their pay. So this policy is also impacting how people feel like we should be paid regardless of our educational acumen. And that I think is a bigger issue that may actually result in a different type of case, hopefully down the road, if this gets overturned. But I do think that while I am supportive of the programs and I strategize with businesses and organizations across the board on how equity can be real and robust, we are not talking about just a mass diversity uh, issue. We are talking about a mass employment issue. We are talking about a mass social mobility issue. And ultimately, we are increasing the divide of the have and the have nots of a community that already did not fully get the full benefit of affirmative action to begin with. That was that was fascinating. And I find it I, I, and I really appreciate the, uh, you know, rather 
daring recommendations you were making, creating new institutional networks and thinking about this, this conflict. That's something I talk about a lot with my students, the tension between ethics and law. And I also love your emphasis on hacking the system. And I wanna, I wanna get uh, uh, Kenya in, and by the way, um, all of you who are watching uh, both on Zoom and also here at school, uh, please start thinking of questions and feel free to submit them to the Q&A in the Zoom. And also for those of you who are actually physically here, my, my, my students and fashion, fashion ethics students and fashion law students, um, uh, there will be a mic that will go around so you can actually ask questions uh, uh, in person as well. Uh, but Kenya, uh, one of the key things in, in hacking a system is under is we, we want to get a sense of the lay of the land, sort of what are we facing? And as somebody who is a, you know, a Washington insider and, and working with the political system, I'd love to have your sense on where we are and what lies ahead. Sure. Um, thank you, Jeff. But before I have a few slides that I'm going to share, but yep. before I get there, That's... I just want to thank you, the Fashion Law Institute, Aereo, um, for bringing us all together this evening to have this safe space in this forum to really discuss and think through these issues. And also a special thank you for Professor Susan Scafidi, because I know Professor Scafidi, I've known you since I was a, a Young Hill staffer many years ago, and you were on the Hill. Um, advocating for independent, actually all designers in the industry. And you have always made diversity, equity, and inclusion a key point of everything that you've done. You've always included diverse voices. And I'm not just talking about racial diversity, but diversity based on lived experiences, background, geography, the list goes on and on. And what I love about everything that you've done is that you've never made it a PR decision. You've never done what you're doing in response to what is perceived to be a trend or in 2020, the racial reckoning. You do it because you love it and it's what you do. And so on behalf of all of the fashion law community, I think I feel comfortable saying this. I just want to say that we see you, we appreciate you and your work does not go unnoticed. So thank you for everything that you've done over the years. We truly appreciate you. Kenya, I'm, I'm literally tearing up, and I'm not even oh. sure you, but thank you so very much. Thank you. And that goes for everyone who's a part of the Fashion Law Institute. Um, last um, comment on this. Um, I don't know if you realize how you built this amazing community. Like some of my closest friends, um, I've met through the Fashion Law Institute. So thank you for uplifting us and building us and creating this diverse community over, it's 12 years now, right? I said 10 plus, but it's closer to 12. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Now on to my slides. I'm going to put my professor hat <laughs> on <laughs> for, for the next five minutes or so. And I have this slide that I always start out with in my fashion law and social justice class. And I always say that um, the fashion industry for many years operated in a silo. That was also the case I felt when I worked at the Motion Picture Association that you everyone had their own little fiefdoms, right? You had um, fashion, you had tech over here, entertainment and media. But now we see how they're all interconnected, especially with jobs and employment and schools. And so when we're thinking about these diversity issues, this is not just a, a challenge for the fashion industry. Fashion cannot do this alone. We need everyone. And so I'm going to share my screen right now so you can see my slides. And part of that also is government, what we're going through right now with the Supreme Court and academia. And so you see how we're all interconnected. And I always say that it's the three C's that's really pushing all of us, all the industries, government, academia, culture, community, and content. And it's really going to be the three C's that help us move forward, regardless of what the Supreme Court decides, although we have a somewhat good idea of what ahead of us. And so I, I want to share both what I perceive to be some of the, the challenges and what we should be thinking about in terms of law and policy, and then also in design and business. What would happen without fashion, without racial diversity? And so I want to start out with the judicial appointments. I don't know if a lot of people realize, but the former administration and members of Congress 
appointed 245 judicial positions, right? That's also including the three Supreme Court justices. And so when we talk about a pipeline of talent in the fashion industry, we also have a pipeline of judges who were appointed by elected officials who do not embrace diversity. So we have to think about how are we going to deal with these cases as they come up at the district court level, at the court of appeals. We're focused on the Supreme Court now, but we have many years ahead of us. And so we have to think about how do we respond? One way is through Congress and the administration. Congress, in theory, they can pass legislation to counteract whatever the Supreme Court does. We saw this, this is a different um, case, but it was in the, um, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay case. Some of you may remember that, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Well, it was actually Justice Ginsburg's dissenting opinions. I'm moving on to the third one, where Justice Ginsburg challenged Congress and said the legislature must correct the Supreme Court's reading back then. And that's exactly what happened. But we also need to look at the concurring opinions that come out of this case too. This came up in the, in the Dobbs case in June, right? We're discussing education right now, but what does this mean for employment and housing and public accommodations and other areas? How far is the court going to go on this? So all important things that we must look at. And then also when we talk about design and business, um, I am very concerned and we, everyone else has said this, Peter, Colette, I mean, Fee, about the talent pipeline. How are we going to get diverse talent? Um, and, and this is very important. I, I, I must admit, not at Fordham Law where I've taught, but I have had semesters where I have not had one black student in my class within the past five years. And that's something that definitely needs to be corrected. Um, how, how do we make sure that we have this pipeline of talent getting in the door so that they have access to internships and a, an expanded network as they're looking at? Um, Colette mentioned LinkedIn, but how do we have that like one-on-one -on -one connection with our students? Well, we have to get the students first. Another concern that I have um, is the difference between performative statements and real action. So as Professor Scafidi mentioned at the beginning, there have been a number of um, pledges. We've seen commitments from the fashion industry through various organizations. And so those who have made real action, they're going to continue to find ways to make action, right? They're going to look for innovative ways to really increase their DEI numbers and make it so that the talent that's coming in, that they're treated equitably and they feel included. But what about those companies? And there were several who just had a black box on Instagram. They were doing just enough to get by. And those are the companies that we're going to see. They're just going to fade away because they'll feel that they have no obligation. They are not required to embrace DEI, and so they won't even worry about it. Um, and, and then we have the mid-level talent, those who have got in the door, um, the talent who um, got into universities and colleges through affirmative action and race-conscious admissions. They are in their positions right now, but will they have someone to mentor them? Let's say if, if employers are not focused on DEI because they feel it's not legally required, then will those em um, employees leave? Probably, because they won't have someone looking out for them who's making them feel included. And so in go going back to Colette's um, comments, that's when we're going to start to see retention problems, right? And, and so how do you keep that talent, those junior and mid-level employees who are already there, how do you keep them there if the court determines that affirmative action, which is what looks like it's headed, is no longer the law? So um, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jeff. Oh, well, no, thank you. And that was, uh, Kenya, that was amazing. And uh, I'm going to move uh, to some questions for all of you. Um, uh, in light of everything that's been happening over the past, it, it literally, it, it may seem odd, but I'm literally over the past few weeks and months. Uh, that's how quickly everything is changing. That's how quickly the lawsuits are coming. 
um, and, and the new statutes that we're having to deal with at the state level, uh, as well as you know, you know the, the ongoing Supreme Court case. Um, but before we do get to the Q&A, I want to give our second uh, CLE code, uh, because it is a theme that's been emerging throughout this entire discussion, and that CLE code is strategy, strategy. So uh, for those of you who are getting continually education, legal education uh, credit, a strategy is the second CLE code. Uh, but I want to have a question, a question that was uh, uh, the first question that, that came in. So I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, mention this right here. And it's one that uh, uh, actually has to do with strategy. And I'll just read it to you. I'm curious whether it is legal to consider other factors like club affiliations, schools attended, childhood zip codes, and other factors that may help us identify diverse and underrepresented groups when hiring. And I'll, and I'll take this back to Peter first, because I know that you've been, you've been, you've been thinking through this and, and, and Colette and Ify and Kenya, I, I definitely please feel free to weigh in on this question. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, guys. I may punt this one to you, Colette, because you're in you <laughs> you hire during your day job in this context. But you know what little I know is there are other indicia that if you are shrewd enough, you can use to make a decision that might allow you to to stay committed to your your diversity hiring aims. So you know, I think I think I think to Ippy's point, I think we have to just sort of re you know, re-strategize a, a way of looking. I know in California, for example, that, you know, there are, I think, 13 different indicia that, that, that the UC system looks at um, when they're looking at students with an aim to see if they can't, you know, come up with a workaround um, for what they're no longer able to do. So, you know, I, I, think, I think it just requires some resourcefulness and thoughtfulness um, about other aspects of, of one's um, profile that might lead you to determine that that you know you should consider their hire because they they represent um, a diverse candidate. That that was a, that's a really good point. And you mentioned you mentioned the University of California system. They're one of those states where, in the education context, there was some sort of legal restriction put on them. Correct. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so the sort of stuff that you that you're dealing with in education now, um, this is this isn't new to uh, you all either. It's not in the sense. Of, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think there are you know we try through our talent search, I'll call it, you know, to 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 do it very anonymously in terms of the submissions that we receive that are based on a case study profile. But you know, certainly for Virgil's um, applicants. You know, and other named scholarship opportunities we have, we look to other indicia um, from the student besides, certainly besides the GPA, certainly besides the case study itself, and just other aspects of who they are and their interest in the fashion industry that might demonstrate or, or events, you know, their talent and 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 the fact that they may have had some challenges that require or or, or lead to our our favorable disposition. I'm, I'm gonna I am gonna throw this over to Colette in a second, but you just said something here that reminded me of of something that I heard in the oral argument um, for the UNC and Harvard cases, where they would talk about applications essays and. Um, and how maybe universities would no longer be allowed to consider race, but they could consider an essay where they talked about overcoming discrimination. Do you see potential both in education, fashion education, and in the industry at large for creating some sort of criteria or just some sort of general recognition um, of overcoming discrimination or overcoming certain obstacles as a sign of of resilience uh, that would be helpful for hiring in the business context that would be helpful in uh, getting a scholarship. I mean, do you see that as something with potential? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I, you know, I think one of the things we struggle with as an organization is, um, is this merit based um, competition equitable? And, you know, I'd argue that it is not because I think there are students that literally don't have the time to complete our rigorous case study because they're holding down two jobs. So they don't have the, the time. Hmm. Required, um, to be able to compete successfully. But, you know, another addition for us has been traditionally one's GPA. Well, we, we looked a little harder this year at 
at that GPA requirement and ask the students who didn't meet that mark, were there any extenuating, extenuating circumstances that they wanted to share? And I would say to a student, they shared circumstances that were so compelling to, to us that, that you know, meant that we move them forward into the pool of applicants. And so I, you know, it's, it's an example of looking a little more closely at circumstance and at challenge that I think will, will I hope lead to a kind of a more equitable and inclusive approach, um, certainly to us with, with scholar applicants, but I would suggest um, if you were making a hire, it's kind of that second round of questions and requests for a little bit more color and context that's not um, so obvious on, on the on the CV page. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really interesting and important point. And so I'll bring it over uh, to Colette about both the other factors, club affiliations, attend, schools attended, childhood zip codes and other factors. And also just to open it up a little bit, um, how in-house counsel can respond to what Ippy was talking about with regard to a uh, risk. I was just thinking that actually, um, <laughs> I literally was just thinking about it really is, it depends on the company's risk tolerance. Um, I think if he made an excellent point, uh, the law is not necessarily, uh, the law doesn't necessarily move the needle, it's resistance, it's opposition that does move the needle, even, and it, when you look at it within a, a corporate context, it's it's we call it change management people don't like change right and so you you're even even with the best intention if you're not deliberate and pushing against another thing that if he talked uh, talked about unbuilding what was built i mean when you're changing that's what you're doing you're 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 unbuilding what had been built upon what is not broken right so why do we need to fix it it's been around you know, our brands range from, uh, uh, our oldest brand is 200 years old. Um, our youngest brand is probably 20 something years old. So these are our brand um, cultures that have been around for a really long time. So why are we changing something that works? Well, if you don't, if you don't push against it, if you don't unbuild it, it's not going, it's not going to change. In terms of uh, using other criteria, it, it based on my reading of where the court was going, they seem to be for perfectly fine with using anything but race. Once you say race, um, everything shuts down. But you can consider other factors. The challenge is that, and what you've seen in the uh, California university system is these non-race-based programs, they don't produce the diversity. And so even though race is just one factor in the 40 that the University of North Carolina considers, when you take that out, um, I think um, it was Justice Jackson, she, I gave the example of a college, a college essay from two students writing about their family history in North Carolina. One, um, a white student talking about their history, another black student talking about their history and the fact that their family were, their family were descendants of slaves. But in the black example, may not be able to say that because that's going to tie to race. So she brought up the fact, how is that equal? So it's, it's, I mean, I, again, I, I'm, the fact that we find ourselves just challenging the notion of diversity is, is really concerning. But I do think if I said earlier that our customers demanded, despite what we see going on, our customers want diversity, whether it's a 200-year-old brand or a brand that is geared towards uh, teenagers and Gen Z. They want diversity, so they're not going to go backwards. Our employees demand, trust me, our employees demand diversity. So I do think as, a, as companies look at these issues, we're going to have to look at our 
our tolerance for risk. And maybe those that tend to be more conservative are going to, you're going to have to push it a little bit in order to bring about the change that you're looking for. And that was, and if that was another thing that I, that I loved about what you were talking about, which was, it reminded me, you know, how there are, are two types of approach to law and um, legal restrictions and boundaries. You know, one is just uh, to, to use them as grounds for just saying no constantly. And I know that there, there are certain people uh, that, that take that approach to law. Uh, but then the others, you know, uh, they're just a source of, of resistance that you can challenge. Uh, you know, and just like uh, resistance, you know, pulling some bands or lifting weights can give you strength, um, that pushing against that and being creative as you engage um, can actually make things stronger and better, um, even if it, it was challenging. I know, and, and, yeah, and Jeff, Jeff, is there, just very quickly, if I could add something. Yeah, please um, do. To this. Um, in addition to what Colette was raising, um, and as, as I raised earlier, there are schools that are drastically struggling with, in the state of California, it was a law. You, uh, Michigan has actually had this for a very long time. It's been over 15 years, um, and they've poured millions of dollars to try to rectify this. Native American youth in one year went down 11% in University of Oklahoma. I say all this to say um, that these are gains we can't get back. Right, like we have to also look at this as not just statistics, but these are human beings that are connected to communities where they are often the ones that many families are relying on for there to be um, some type of possibility. So I just want to put that out there that the risk is not just there to be radical, but it's also connecting to human beings that are right. often the ones that are moving things. But I do want to caution. Um, because this is kind of where the world of race neutrality has always been not neutral, um, that a lot of spaces, um, not only um, in higher education, but in other forms of application, have tried to replace race um, with income. Mm -hmm. And that is a caution, because anyone who does civil and human rights law knows that income is a false equivalency to race. It is not that there are not implications or overlaps of the two, but the data has shown that having an income-based uh, way of looking at things, thinking that you are going to, um, in many ways, catch all, um, especially those who are connected to marginalized communities, not only doesn't catch all of those community members um, for a lot of different reasons, including assumptions around income, but it also um, has a dangerous, um, it dangerously enables people to practice in forgetting, for lack of a better word, the realities as to why we're focused on race to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also why, why there's friction between, yes, we must uplift all multi-marginalized communities, but we also need to be careful that when we say BIPOC, we're not erasing indigenous history. We're not erasing black history. We're not erasing anti-Semitism. We're not erasing the histories that are connected to communities that need those protections because of their race or ethnicity. So I put that out there that in our strategies, if we are looking for the different indicia, race is the strongest indicator as to whether you succeed in this society. Therefore, not looking at race when you are looking at these opportunities is going, it, even if it has some type of gain, it's not going to have the type of gains that we are seeing now, which is still a struggle. Only one third of four year public and private institutions actually consider race period in the United States. And I also want to stress that the reason why it had to be affirmative action is because the courts had determined, determined that quotas were not the way to go. Um, and I'm just saying that because I had I was asked to speak in London um, in Parliament as 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 they are actually considering quotas in spaces like law firms and business institutions as a viable means of moving. Um, moving candidates through and they were referencing the dissents of U.S. Supreme Court decisions as they were making um, these determinations. So I, I just want to put that out there that affirmative action is also not the best strategy and we have known that. 
um, and that there has been case law that other places are looking at. Um, so again, I think the the radicalness or the the risk is not necessarily creating a new, but being really familiar with the arguments that were used before. And we are in a much more progressive space now that as Colette mentioned, 200 year old companies may not take that risk for a lot of different reasons. But companies that are a little bit newer um, and have especially embraced um, the last five to 10 years of movement building may be able to say, we're gonna take this challenge. And to the point that Kenya was mentioning, we know what our courts look like in this jurisdiction. So we're also gonna prepare legally for what that means. Um, because I still wanna remind people that a lot of companies moved in 2020, not because of the law, but because of disruption. And so we have to be honest about how things move um, in society. An important point, and it gets to actually a question that was raised about. Excuse the, me, Jeff. Uh, I, I have one more comment. Oh, please do. Um, please. Just echoing everything that everyone has just said, E.P., um, Colette, and Peter. But one concern that I have in the employment context is that um, tokenism is still very real. And this has happened to me. If I'm the token Black at, at an office, and they're looking to diversify. I've had my direct um, supervisors ask me, do you have any friends? We have an open position, assuming that all of my friends are black. And so that's one strategy that they're trying to use to get diverse talent, but in some ways it, it's offensive, to be honest. And so as we have fewer people of color who are gonna be in these positions, if affirmative action dies, which it probably wills, will, then we're going to have one or two people and the burden is going to be on them within their companies to help their companies make sure that their workforce is, there, is diverse. And to be honest, that's not their job. They, yes, they can do what they're doing and embrace diversity, but they didn't get hired to cover DE&I right, in HR, they are there to serve a purpose, whether that's as a designer, um, sustainability manager, or whatever they're doing. And so my concern is that we also have to create support networks for our um, Black talent, Brown talent, all of our talent, so that they don't feel overwhelmed and burdened that it's their responsibility to not only do their day-to-day, -day, but also serve as the recruitment for DEI. and mm -hmm. And network can definitely be a powerful force for for change in any institution, um, that as as we've seen in in fashion and and as, and as you said in fashion law. I, I was looking up. If you see, I, I see me looking up a little bit right now. It's because it's seven fifteen, and I wonder if I, could, I, I for those of you who have to leave because I know we set the time for seven fifteen. Uh, I, I want to say thank you for attending and and thank you for being a part of this uh, incredibly important talk. And as Professor Scafidi said at the beginning. This really is the start of a conversation. It isn't the finish. Uh, we're going to uh, continue this conversation, I think, for months and years to come amongst us. And I hope uh, that there are other opportunities where we can get together and, and speak and, and have more, even more conversation about this important topic and, and how we can develop strategies to move forward. I hope you don't mind if I, if I could, uh, and a quick word to our wonderful panel. Uh, would you be willing to stay a few extra minutes to, just for a few more questions? If you can, because you've been amazing and and just just incredible, uh, and I, I'm beginning to think that just like the Supreme Court oral argument went for five hours, it's, we should have just booked it for that uh, just to start. But I'm afraid I wouldn't have been able to get anybody to, to, to come on board. Uh, I, I want to throw it out. By the way, I know we've had some uh, questions and on the chat, and I want to throw it out in the room. As I've said, I'm in a room with a, a number of students. Uh, does anyone have any questions for our? Um, I see a question right over here. So we're gonna we're going to uh, uh, just so you know what's what's happening is we're giving them a microphone and I hope you can hear. I'm going to repeat the question if you can't. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate this talk, uh, Professor. Thank you so much for this. Uh, my name is Isabella, and I was hearing you out on the importance of recruiting diversity, but I think something that's sometimes overlooked is retaining diverse uh, members in law firms. There's not enough uh, diverse people of color that are partners or senior associates. And what are ways that you can 
actively try to retain them and not overwork them or burden them by making them take parts in DEI initiatives, whether that's, mm. you know, without the, them, their consent, or I'm Hispanic, Latino, and a lot of times when I've worked, I was just taken in to translate whether I liked it or not, not part of my job description, an additional time over time that I've had to do. And I speak, I'm also part of the Latino organization here. A lot of people also feel like they have gone through that in the legal field as well, where they have to take on these additional tasks. And a lot of people don't want to retain their job. So maybe that's an additional reason as to why we don't see many senior associates or managing partners or uh, managing attorneys, and even in the fashion industry as well. So how are active ways that you guys suggest retaining um, diverse candidates and diverse attorneys and diverse um, people in the fashion industry. So how to, retu how to retain um, diverse uh, attorneys, people with legal expertise, you know, anybody in the fashion industry uh, uh, who's, who's brought on and they're a valuable part of that diversity. And I, and I love there's one aspect of that question that I particularly want to highlight, which is what you said. And, and we've, we've all seen this, I think, in firms, which is, uh, and this gets to something that Kenya was talking about earlier, uh, where we say, okay, well, we're bringing in people uh, from diverse backgrounds, so we're going to make them, um, we're, we're going to <laughs> just be a little bit too overbearing on this. And so the, the person who's from a certain background, they're automatically part of a, uh, a special, put in front of everybody to symbolize DEI or brought in to translate or brought in to uh, work with certain types of clients, but not other types of clients, you know, uh, or certain, HR oriented things, but not other things. And how, how do you retain people who might be alienated, not just because they feel like they're not included, but because they're over included on something that they really didn't come there to do? I mean, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Colette mentioned it, and it's something that we do very thoughtfully. Um, at the Fashion Scholarship Fund, which is mentoring. And you know what we've learned over the years is, and I do think this works in the law firm context, is it's not just being mentored by someone senior who might be able to give you advice, but someone much more junior who looks like you, who has had the same experiences that you are having, to whom you can really speak very frankly. Um, because I think oftentimes you can be you can feel very alone at a law firm or in another corporate context. Um, so it's really trying to make sure that there are other folks um, that can be identified like, like the most junior who, who, who can be mentored in a very, you know, deliberate, thoughtful way. Um, you know, I, I was um, in a law firm years ago as, and as a, a young gay associate, and, you know, it was very, very alienating for me back in that day. And, there were no gay partners at my my law firm and so you know it was it was not an experience that that led to my wanting to stay other than the day i made partner i quickly very shortly thereafter left but you know i i think you've got to create an environment where you feel um nurtured and supported by people who look like you who talk like you who have gone through the same experiences or you will there will not be an ability to retain and we hear it from our corporate partners all the time, they're doing a much better job of attracting talent, as Colette said, but they are not doing a good job at retaining that talent, especially underrepresented talent. The, the attrition rate at most of our corporate partners of underrepresented talent is far higher than that of, of, of talent, of different talent. So, you know, I think it's really creating a, a safe space, quite frankly, and, and a, a, a mentoring dynamic with folks that you can really relate to. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I to add on to that, I will I will say that I have not been in spaces where there was someone that looked like me. I don't. I think now we're creating a little bit more, but I have not. So what 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 did that mean for me? That meant for me that I looked, I had to look to others who were intentional about being a mentor to me, and so it's and what we're trying to do frankly, at our own company is we recognize that as you get higher up, there are less and less people of color in these higher positions. And you can't have the chief legal officer, for example, be the lone mentor mm -hmm. <laughs> for all of, uh, all 
all of the corporate employees is just it's not practical that would be that would you would be very busy <laughs> that would be even more busy so, <laughs> but what you do need to do is you call on your other management and say you have to be intentional um, I keep going back to the words intentional and deliberate. It is so easy to go to the familiar, to keep doing what you've always done, because it's easy. It's easy for me to just go to this person. It's easy for me to just go to that person because we're under deadlines and we need to get things done. You have to be intentional. You have to deliberately go outside what your quote unquote normal circle your normal go-to. You have to be patient. Um, a lot of times it's about training. It's about having the patience to sit down with someone who's learning this for the first time. Oftentimes, I remember as an associate, I felt like, oh my gosh, why don't, why don't I know, you know, uh, the Delaware corporate law uh, line by line? Um, how does everybody else around me? And it really, you know, you deal with, um, I, the word is escaping me, um, but you feel that uh, sense that you're, in, I'm sorry, imposter syndrome, like, what am I doing here that I don't know it? And it dawned on me, wait a second. He didn't know it either. And he, it took him time to learn it. And so it's about recognizing that you're, it's training. So again, you have to be deliberate to train and take the time. And so, because I will say, if you're a person of color, as much work as companies and law firms are trying to do, you're not going to find a lot of people yet. But if you have a firm, if you have a company that's making a commitment that is setting up programs that are not necessarily about diversity under topic, but more just training, mm -hmm. giving opportunities, providing meaningful work, like as opposed to, again, you give in the work to your go-to associate give it, spread it out so that more people have more opportunities to, to, to get the work and possibly shine. Cause mm -hmm. it just takes that one time to get in the door. And once you're in the door, you're, 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 you're in a much better position, but it's getting in the door. So you have to be intentional. I also wanted to add that I think there are two sides here, right? It's what the employer should be doing to create this um, nurturing and supportive environment, but it's also up to the talent, to the law firm associate to speak up for him or herself. Because if, if you don't show that you respect yourself, no one else will. And so I'm not advising that you do this if you're just starting out. To be honest, it took me several years to work up the courage. But now I feel very confidently saying no, excuse me, confidently saying no, I'm not going to do it. it. That's not within my bandwidth right now. I do not have the time. I am going to focus on my work. If at some point this is something I want to do, I will do it. But it is okay to say no. I'm, I'm actually going to take a different <laughs> different approach to that as somebody who used to work on Wall Street and also lost, worked on it right before ba Bernie Madoff, which is just to say that the current climate that we are approaching right. is actually a very scary climate for Black and Brown associates. We are typically the first ones to be slashed um, at big law firms um, during times like this. Um, so Isabella, let me just call out and to say to you that um, Believe it or not, it is actually racist to ask you to speak in any type of dialect without that being something that you have both A, agreed and consented to, um, but it's also wrong that the assumption would be that you A, speak it, um, and to something that Colette had said earlier, that others don't, right, regardless of their race or ethnicity. Um, or that you use it in a way that would be that would be a part of a business setting. Um, I grew up in a part of Jersey where a lot of people spoke Spanish, but what people are asking you know you to do or to translate may not necessarily be um, the space that that you are um, proficient in. And the reason why I mention that is because that puts an additional burden on the person of color to present themselves as the stereotype that many industries assume that we are to be. 
Um, and I think that it's a tough decision as an early associate to say, I don't want to do that or I can't do that. And I just want to put that out there that um, I, I wish that it was as easy um, to, to say that I cannot be treated this way. But I do want to highlight that to the extent of I'm going to move away from mentorship and start you all now should start looking for sponsors, which are completely different than mentors. You all should be looking for people that are actually going to advocate and use their privilege to ensure that you are okay, that you are safe, and that they are in a position of power to have those conversations that you can't have. And that unfortunately is the reality of big law. Um, I'm happy to discuss with anyone on the side as to what that looks like as far as advocacy, but the truth of the matter is the, the statistics, even in a place as diverse as New York City, are not good for especially Black and Brown women associates. Um, obviously, for Black women, we are far further from adjacency. Of, uh, it doesn't matter what I deem to my face, my hair, my whatever. I am always going to be a Black woman, and I love being a Black woman, and I say all that to say that I am not able to really rely on anything um, to escape what people assume about me in those spaces. Um, but I do want to say that regardless of race or ethnicity in this space, for anyone that comes from a multi-marginalized community, start identifying individuals regardless of whether they're in your industry or not, to, to, and whether or not they work in your law firm or not, just so you can have a safe space to figure out how to maneuver if you choose to stay. Something that Kenya had raised is absolutely correct. Get connected with your HR teams. At least just know who is there because you should be able to ask the question of what do I do when I'm doing my job and I'm asked to do more. And also, finally, if people are going to ask you for extra work, they need to pay you. And that is something that is increasingly starting to happen, even with ERG groups at law firms. You can't ask people to build upon the equity that the law won't even do and ask people to do that for free. That is actually an extra service to that law firm. They're going to put it on their brochure. You should be paid for that. Really, really interesting. And I, really, I like the interesting shift from a, from a mentorship model to almost like a patron model. Uh, uh, it's a really interesting thing. And we have two questions. Uh, one, Suzanne, I believe you had a question. And we have an interesting question online about international DEI, and then we're going to call it an evening. You've been all been amazing. Uh, yes, hi. Ah. Hi, Suzanne. Um, yeah, one question I have is um, it's a major, it's been a movement in corporate law departments when they're hiring outside counsel to actually put uh, percentages or requirements on a law firm to have a certain number of partners, a certain number of associates on a panel, like a preferred panel that they hire. Um, do you think in light of this potential decision that will be something that corporate America will not want to do anymore? And or law firms? This is a very interesting question, not just in panels, uh, but we haven't talked about it yet. But one of the things that I know we've been talking about here at the Fashion Law Institute is, what about product mix? Um, so the question was, uh, what about uh, the practice that we have in, and it's not just in, in law firms, but it's also in, in businesses. And uh, I do a lot of stuff with comics. And we have people talking about whether there needs to be a certain percentage of people from different backgrounds on the panels. And the question was, uh, do you think that in light of the, the precedent that that's going to change to have a, basically uh, uh, quotas for uh, panels and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it, got, it, it also has me thinking about product mix. You know, we've seen moves recently to say, you know, a certain percentage of, of, of products should be people from this background or the product mix should, should represent uh, the, the, the mix of the population generally in terms of who owns the companies that provide it or what culture the uh, products represent. And I'm wondering what you think about that and how, how those sorts of things, from panels to products, could be affected by what the Supreme Court is likely to do in the realm of, of, of uh, consideration of, of race and color in education. Well, I'll, I'll jump on this one. I think from there are going to be those companies that are on, I'll call it the, the diversity, equity, inclusion bandwagon, because that was that was the thing to do. Um, they checking, well, I call that, we call that here checking the box. 
-hmm. And there are going to be other companies that have made diversity, equity, inclusion a part of their mission, a part of their their brand DNA and how they want to move forward. So while the decision may make, as we started out, may require more creativity, a company that's committed to diversity, inclusivity, equity, they're going to still want to see that in 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 the firms that represent them. And I don't and I don't think it would necessarily be against the law. It might be a risk, but I don't necessarily think it would be against the law to say, well, what is your diversity? I mean, I think that's a perfect perfectly neutral answer a, a question to ask. Cause you're I mean, because diversity we we're focused on race, but there's so much more to diversity mm -hmm. than ju just race. So I think that's perfectly fine to to ask that question. In terms of product mix, we don't, I, I'm not aware of any of our brands that we have a particular mandate on a certain mix of products. There may be, there are brands that have committed, made certain commitments. I don't think that necessarily changes uh, because um, if it's based on a business decision, diversity makes companies money. That's something that we haven't really, we haven't talked about at all. Like, I mean, it's great, you know, it's it's great for me to sing my, the praises of Spark, which I think is a great company to work for, but trust, we're not doing anything. We're not doing this just because we're nice people, it makes us money. Mm -hmm. And um, to the extent that it continues to make us money, we're going to, we're going to back it. That's just the re that's the reality of it. It gives us better, better talent and it, it increases our bottom line. And as an in-house attorney, if anyone goes in in-house, you will understand just how important that bottom line is. <laughs> So it's an interesting it, is, it is all. So yes. it, it there's, you know, there's um again, we are nice people at Spark, but diversity is profitable. Now I'm gonna throw this question since we're, since I, yes. I I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, I just want to oh. add on real quick, Jeff. Yeah, just just yep. to add on to what Paulette said, like going back to the slide that I had on performative statements and real action, I think we're gonna see the companies that have been making real action continue to make real action. But those that may have just had like in the front of their store, like featuring these are our black designers or this is our black section, those brands and retailers, they're gonna fall off and we won't see as many of that product placement in the front of the stores. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting because we're already seeing, just as we're seeing people challenging scholarships and challenging stock filings and challenging all these, again, we have these cases in the CLE uh, materials. Um, you know, I've been doing some research and I, we're already seeing some people pushing the boundaries of uh, the first Civil Rights Act, 42 USC 1981, which talks about anti-discrimination, not considering race and color in, um, in contracts, and that affects independent contractors. That affects relationships with vendors, and I think we're going to see some very interesting moves in that in, in the near future in terms of where push, people are trying to push to extend what we're seeing in the Supreme Court. But I'm going to open this up internationally because if you've raised this earlier and get to our last question, and then thank you, our long-suffering panelists, thank you so much for staying extra. Um, how can those of us based in London improve DEI within our legal system and law firms? I believe in learning and sharing ideas and the UK could definitely learn and make use of certain initiatives instead of still using the tick box mentality to drive DEI. I, I'll just build upon, um, we've had a steady flow of clients for the last three, three to four years and actually a little longer in this space. And anyone who's working in Europe knows that the way they look at um, equity is very different um, and still needs a lot of work. One of the areas that they are very active and vocal about is gender um, equity and gender diversity. Um, and in many ways, that is problematic for a lot of us that sit on the intersection of being a person of color and a, a, a woman or non-male non identifying. Um, so 
if there's one area for those of you that are very interested in how you can be supportive, especially in those ERG groups and in those ESG groups, is to really look at how they look at intersectionality um, as a conversation um, to explore how they look at their trends from hiring um, to promotion to firing. Do they even collect exit? Um, and that's an issue here, to be honest with you. That's not just the UK thing, but do they even um, disaggregate their data as it relates to why people are, who they're recruiting, how people are saying thing, and are they transitioning out? One of the things that we found um, is that um, the, in, in many ways, the experiences that um, uh, Black Americans experience here and, and, and Black femme folk experience here, um, Asian American or excuse me, Asian communities within UK are the ones that are also experiencing some of that, that stark um, uh, relative disparities. And a lot of that has to do with immigration policy. So if you are also exploring um, how you can support that conversation, really focusing on bi the bias as it relates to immigration is important. Um, and, uh, but I will also say that um, some of the, 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 the touchier areas in, um, in the UK are still also related to a lot of what we discussed here, which is who gets into what schools. And a lot of how people get into schools, that pipeline is also very much connected to where you live. Um, and so I just want to make sure that when we're talking about diversity um, or equity, um, that we are not just starting at higher education or we are not just starting in the workplace, that the pipeline is real. We are all in a pipeline to somewhere and come from a pipeline. Um, and so it's it's really important that um, if you are if you are looking at those spaces, really using the data and supporting how your industries um, start to disaggregate or maybe look a little bit more uh, with a little bit more scrutiny at the data. Is, is a really is really an asset. I will say that most employers welcome that type of um, exploration, um, but surprisingly, a lot of them have not necessarily been pushed to do that, um, largely because the homogeneity is, is, is there. And that's really important to highlight that a lot of the companies have, are doing really well, um, or they report that they're doing, doing really well in gender equity. Um, I, I use the famous line, um, ain't I a woman when I was speaking to one of those in one of those spaces because there was not a single black woman that was there. I think there were about two um, Asian women that were there and yet they were reporting that they were doing well on gender diversity. And my question to them was, are you doing well on gender diversity if women of color aren't there because we are also women. So we do still have some work there as to who gets included in gender diversity. But um, this, is, this is an area that I think a lot of, um, I actually think this is where um, a lot of even these conversations like this, um, regardless of race and ethnicity, United States is really ahead than a lot of spaces and how we actually look at the sophistication of, of equity. Um, so yeah, those are just some of my thoughts. Mm. Uh, I, I want to thank you. That's very interesting, uh, very interesting considerations. And I, and I love that we, uh, that, that you've been able to bring in the, the international component. Uh, we, we had a question about uh, the understanding of equity is um, all boats rise, I think, if he also was discussing earlier. Um, but I want to end it, you know, we're, we're facing an incredibly challenging time. And I know a lot of people are upset and they are understandably and justifiably upset um, as they deal with the challenge of working through the ethical issue, how do we continue these commitments in light of a changing legal framework, um, just adapting to the legal framework and making old law adapt to new. Um, and I'm wondering if we could close on um, just one sentence from each of you. Um, would you have, and maybe there, maybe there is none, maybe there are some, um, but would you have an encouraging word to anybody who is trying to deal with this, this issue, working through this design problem in the years ahead in the face of, uh, of a changing legal and, and cultural framework. Uh, but what would you say to somebody who is, who is trying to face this problem, come to you at advice? Um, I'll open this up to the floor. Just one sentence, just one quick parting thought. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for the invitation. Um, Jeff, I appreciated that you kept using the word design 
um, because in a lot of artwork, if, you, if it's designed, it can be undesigned, right? But but right. undesigning is a choice. So I think that for those that are very interested in how you boldly use the law um, to to um, kind of not only build better, but also to to make repairs, um, I encourage everyone to to look into that. We are going to need those type of lawyers moving forward. Mm. So everybody who's and, and everybody who's stayed in this as well, you're all going to be needed. Everybody's going to be part of building the future. Any additional quick parting thoughts? I can never follow Ify, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> As you all learned tonight, it's, she's a hard act to follow. Ify is amazing. I'm so honored to get to know you this evening. Thank you. Um, I just want to add um, well, two final thoughts, one sentence. For those of you doing the work, which is all of us here today, we just have to keep pushing, right? Just keep doing what we're doing. But of course, make sure that we do it in a responsible manner, which gets us into the law and policy. This is why we, we still need to keep advocating on Capitol Hill. Um, and not just um, with Congress, but in the administration as well to make sure that we have the government resources and the policies to help us make change because this isn't just for industry. It's not just for academia. It's not just for government. We're all in this together. So it's going to take all of us to move forward. And, and Colette, any, any parting thoughts? Wow, I was trying to think. Um, again, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the, the panel I enjoyed meeting and this panel list are amazing. So it was great to, to be even be in your company. Um, I'm trying to think from an in-house perspective, uh, we're lean and mean. And so, you know, I always joke and say, we're in the business of getting things done. So we deal with impossible impossibilities every day. And so this is just one more, one more thing that we'll have to be a little bit more creative look at our you know risk tolerance but it's certainly not impossible and, and I, it's important I, I suspect colette that you deal with six impossible things before breakfast every day <laughs> so, this is about <laughs> I, I just want to add my thanks to you all and to emphasize that as many amazing things as I have learned tonight, this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. We don't know what the Supreme Court is going to do, but whatever they do with affirmative action, we need more strategies in this area. Um, but when they do come down with that decision, as many of you know, in the Fashion Institute, we really enjoy high heels, no matter what our gender, um, at least from time to time. And we will not be caught flat-footed, whatever the court does. So on that note, thank you all so very much. Thank Thanks you. Moderator and our thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you to our attendees. Thank you to our amazing panelists. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And for everybody in this room, thank you. Have a good night. Good night.